the Luke. Oh, wow. We're just barely going live. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I have another episode with Luke, Endless Entrepreneurs. We're doing our six tips uh, to help your eBay business. And today we're going to go over uh, storage and inventory systems. And Luke, why don't you introduce yourself again for people who are here that are new? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Luke with Endless Entrepreneurs. Um, I am a part-time clothing, uh, men's clothing eBay seller for the most part. I dab a little bit with women's jeans. Um, I work full-time and build my business part-time, so that's kind of my a little bit of my MO. Um, spend a lot of time in my business. is a lot more than a hobby at this point. And uh, Chris and I have been collaborating and learning from each other and growing our businesses together. And uh, tonight's show, hopefully, we'll, we'll share six tips that really help you with your inventory system. Uh, this is episode three, and we've had a lot of good feedback, and we're really enjoying our Sunday nights kind of chilling and discussing eBay. So I'll kick it back over to you, Chris. Awesome, guys. So if you guys aren't familiar with our format, we each – share a tip and then we debate it and discuss a little bit and we go back and forth and we share a total of six tips for you guys with a q a afterwards you can ask questions throughout but we won't get to it until afterwards so we're just going to get straight into um, tips for inventory systems and my first tip is i use reusable um, reusable tags so on my items i put a number so this is a twenty one seventeen. And so how it works is it's, a, it's on a binder clip, so I can take it off and put it on to um, – I seal most of my items in clear poly bags. And so this would be the 17th item in this bin right here, A21. So if I go into it and open up that bin, there will be in a filing system these numbered 1 through 20. used to be 1 through 30, but that's too many items for um, a bin. That's why you can see it overflowing in some of the bins. Uh, one, now they all have 20 items, so I, I recommend using reusable um, inventory codes, and eventually this will be a barcode. So that's, that's my system, uh, or that's my first tip. What do you think, Luke? Uh, yeah, so first of all, it's a great tip. I have tons of questions because you know I just love asking questions. <laughs> yep. So you said reusable. So let's mm -hmm. discuss process around that item sells, Mm -hmm. When do you replenish that item ID? So like how does that flow in your business as far as replacing that bin? Okay, so so this item sells then what I do is this item number is in the title of my listing So when I print out the printing label sheet um, I print the item and I actually don't take this off um, Until the very very end I, I double check and make sure this is the same number is on the listing and, and then and I match it up and I take this clip off and it goes into a um, just a box of these labels and ideally I'm listing more than I'm selling because I'm trying to grow so my my bin that's full of these tags is empty right now so uh, after I list I'll throw them in the bin I'm trying to stay ahead of the amount that I sell so I'm trying to uh, you know get these to zero but that's that's my system okay that makes a lot of sense so here in this case, Chris is a lot more efficient and well, a bit better managed than I am with that system. That's awesome because I don't actually replenish any of my numbers. I just keep going up and consolidate bins. So that's an awesome tip. If you're able to pull that off and you're able to manage that within your system, that's a great idea because then you never have to renumber your bins, which is a step that I have to do all the time as I consolidate. So that's that's an awesome tip. So second tip is how off or second question is how Frequently, do you lose the clips and the inventory numbers? Does it has it ever happened to you, or is it a really clean process? Is there something you might do differently than you do now as you move forward, or do you really like how it works? Um, now, here's the thing: when I had 30 items in the bin and it was really packed, mm -hmm. then they would they would actually fall off. So I started putting them inside the bag. Okay. So that in case they would fall out, they would just stay inside. But if uh, well, now with only 20 items per bin, they don't. There's more room in the bin, so there's not they're not banging against each other, and so they don't really fall off. I just make sure to affix it really well. Um, and these binder clips, I got them on Bulk Office Supply. There's no affiliate link. I got it for super cheap. Um, I recommend. I mean, they only cost maybe two cents each. Right. So binder clips are awesome. a good way. I think just from listening to you, I'm gonna have to rethink how I uh, how I'm putting my stuff in bins uh, for sure, especially because I. The amount of items I have has been growing in my storage, and I've been 
contemplating the best way to manage it. Right now, I could sell it every quarter, and it's kind of a... Uh, Here's a pair of jeans where the bag is really tight, and so the clip has a really small amount, right? But it's not, it's not falling off. You'd have to really, you'd have to really pull on it to get it to fall off. That's in there. So, like, and just in comparison, right? So, here's a pair of LL Bean pants I have. So I have the right. 12 by 15, and then I'm just taking masking tape, painter's tape, inventory number, and sealing it, and then that goes. But the problem I have, which is what you're kind of solutioning, is I don't. Well, once I ship this, it's not like I go back and go, oh, LLW4 is free. The next time I list an item, I'm going to put it in that bin. Like, I don't have that built into my process, which is a big flaw, especially as I grow. Because right now my process is each quarter, I go into my storage mm -hmm. unit and I go, oh, that bin's half full, that bin's half full. Let me combine them and relabel the bin as now it's N1 to 300 instead of 1 to N to 1, 150, I guess, is the way to say that. Right. So, yeah, I like I like what you're doing better. I think that that's a great that's a great tip, especially for anyone just starting an inventory system. I think that the way you're doing it is the best. Like I would recommend that. And I th I, ideally, they all stay full. Right. That's That's the goal, right? And, and then you don't have you don't have to relabel, which is saving you so much time, right? You're not relabeling your bins, whereas I'm relabeling mine all the time, and I'm yeah. operating for half a quarter with a bin half full, right? Right. So I'm running out of room with bins, and I'm buying more shelving, more bins, and then in reality, I go condense, and then I have a full shelving unit empty of bins because I'm like, oh, I just consolidated half my inventory. So yeah, I, I have to, <laughs> I got to give you props there. I didn't think ahead enough with that. And, that is something this next quarter that I'm going to focus on and kind of tuning up for sure. And be, before we move to your next tip, I just want to, or your first tip is there's old inventory systems in here. So like I started with no, just putting it in the bin without any additional number. So it would just say um, A21, that's it. There was no secondary number. And I have bins over on this side that are still the old system. And those ones I'm just selling through. So like, don't give up if you want to start a new inventory system. Just make, just try to consolidate the other stuff into a, a section so you can manage growing. Because I'm sure even this system, there will be some limitation later. Yeah, no, that's that's an awesome point. Like I've changed throughout, probably like every three to six months, I've added something or improved something. But what I don't spend the time to go back through my thousand other previous items and change it. Mm -hmm. I just start implementing it. Because eventually I'm going to sell through the old stuff. It's going to replace and it's going to cycle out. And that new process is going to be the primary process. And so like, don't get paralyzed in fear thinking, oh, crap, I got to go back through 1,500 items and redo everything. Just start. Just start with a new process for the next 10 listings you do, for every listing after. I mean, that was something, because we talked about with titles, right? Like putting the inventory number in my title. I just started doing it. Well, now most of my listings have it, whereas six months ago they didn't. But because you just stay consistent with it, it goes. So yeah, that's a great point, Chris. All right, well, that's a good segue. I guess I'll jump into my, my first tip. Um, and it kind of builds off of what Chris is saying here, and he kind of alluded to it, but we really didn't dive into it. But is if you're talking about scaling your eBay business, especially as a one-man, a two-man operation where your time is so precious, planning an inventory system where you can find your items as fast as possible when they sell is absolutely key. Like. And I know, and this is not a knock, I hope people don't think this is a dig, but I was in that boat at the beginning too, right? I had a closet, I had my sweaters folded on one shelf, I had my dress shirts all hung up on you know, a rack, I had jeans on the ground somewhere, and it was like an item sold, and I went and I was like, well, I know it's over here somewhere, and they kind of looked through the color, looked for the tag, tried to find it. The amount of time it took to do that, it's not bad for 100 items, it's not bad for 200 items even. I know some sellers who can manage that system with 500, but when you start scaling outside of that, when you can't go right to the spot where it is, grab it and go, you're selling, how many items did you sell today, Chris? 30, 38 items today. 30 items, right? To do that for 38 items and not know exactly where each of them are, you are sacrificing so much time that could be used to list or to you know source or to do anything else that moves your business forward simply by not having a process where you can go right to where that item is, pull it, ship it, and go and be done with it. And I think that those minutes that you sacrifice in the day by not having an inventory system where you know right where it is, it's just, it's huge. Like I think it's a huge negative ROI by not knowing where each item is. And it's tough because it's tough to make the leap. Like I remember, I remember being paralyzed in that, like I had a closet full of just stuff everywhere. And it was like, where do I start? And so I just started with hanging on racks. I used to 
Raken had his, I remember watching Raken's videos with his hangers. They yeah. had tag numbers on them. So I started just hanging stuff with tag numbers. That was my first step. And then I transitioned to like half bins, half helm. And then, and, then, and my bins were like dark pants. Like it wasn't even yeah. like an inventory number. And then you kind of just slowly go. And I just would encourage everyone as a tip, like the more you can do to isolate where each item is and know right away, the more money you're going to make in the long run the more time you're gonna be sourcing and listing and doing the things that generate money for your business. So spending the time up front now, whether you're just starting as a fresh reseller, you're midway through or you're seasoned, if you can find ways to improve finding your items faster, um, I think that's a huge benefit. Um, and I have another one that's gonna piggyback off that, but I'm gonna say it for a little later. So I'm just gonna kind of leave that there. Chris, what are your thoughts on, on that? Do you, um, so you have the different numbers, are they ordered inside the bin? Mm -hmm. No, oh, they, so oh, they're not. Okay, so sort of. So, so let's just do an example. So bin N one through N one hundred. When I initially list everything, it's all in order. So each one goes okay. in in order in the bin. You know, kind of goes. I can usually fit four on a level. So it's like you know N one through four, and then N five through eight, and they kind of just layer on each other. And so when I condense my bins. I'll take N100 through, or N1 through 100 and N2, what was it, 101 through 200, and I'll just put them on top of each other. So they stay in order sequentially. But what happens is as I sell, N1 through N200 becomes, well, I have N1, and then the next closest is N8, right, because I sold N2 through 7. And so that's mm -hmm. where kind of the order crux happens. But they are technically in order, which helps me a lot. Like I, I, you know, I just flip through looking for colors. Also, the clear poly bags, guys. I'm, if you're going to store your items, the clear poly bags it adds an additional layer of visibility to your item outside of the inventory tag, right? If I know I'm looking for a purple check shirt and it's the only purple check shirt in that bin, that clear poly bag allows me to see it faster, even if I don't see the inventory number right away, and then I can just pull it out. So, just another kind of piece to that. Um, that or uh, that. That tip, I guess it doesn't, there's no, no good segue to go into my second idea, but no, that's um, fine. You're good. my second tip is to store non-like items in the same bin. So like these are both A21. I have a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. And so when these are in the bin right next to each other, and I know I sold a pair of jeans, I can't pick the wrong pair if, if there's only, you know, three or four pairs of jeans in there. And the more mixed up it gets, if there's hats, hard goods, jeans, shirts, all in the same bin, then it's really easy. I don't even need the number on it. I can just reach into it based on the shape and the color of the item and pull it straight out. Um, this, is, this is how Amazon does it. So Amazon doesn't store like items. And when I was selling a lot of um, dress shirts or jeans especially, they all look identical. Unless you pull it out, look at the tag, they're all different. So I like having less items in the bins um, and then having – as many different ones as possible. If I have this shirt, these shoes, and jeans, and I sold this a pair of shoes, I'm gonna know right away. So I'm trying to reduce defects, which is a, um, a huge issue when you start getting some more volume. If you ship the wrong item, if you um, switch up two items, then you now you have two customer service problems and two unhappy customers. So I'm trying to um, store unlike items, but it also, it brings some challenges. So, Luke, I'll, I'll open it up for the forum for your questions on this one. Yeah. So, well, first of all, that's a great tip because I've never thought about it that way. I've never really thought about it as, oh, they're so different that I couldn't mix them up, which actually makes me more efficient when I go to find my items. And that's so true, though. Like, you're dead on with it. I've just never viewed it that way. But this creates some major challenges. And I think that's what you're alluding to. You're like, oh, boy, here comes the questions on this is, so we talk a lot about, both me and you, we preach up and down batching items. Mm -hmm. So you, on your first go around then, as you're growing, you don't really experience that, right? You have a lot of similar items. Mm -hmm. You get the unlike items as you relist because you're reusing numbers and the items become different. Is that a correct statement? Mm -hmm. No, I still batch lists. So when I come in here, I'll be, re I'll be putting back 30 pairs of jeans or something. Right. I'm saying I'm putting them in the bins with t-shirts or shoes or, right. or whatever. And that's where you get the upside of the mix right. by doing that. But if you were to say all your inventory numbers are empty like now mm -hmm. and you start a fresh bin and you're batching items, now you have 20 dress shirts in one bin, right? Yes. 
20, so that's the, yeah. right to start with and, to, and then as you sell through you get more upside and more mix right i mean that's kind of how is, it, this, is, this is a good point is. actually 30 dress shirts fit in a bin 30 dress shirts okay yeah you, so you know I what i'm this, saying though you know what i'm getting to though right but i'm saying the point is with the 30 dress shirts being in the bin a g jeans are twice as big as shirts right so when i tried this inventory system and i i was like putting back jeans they wouldn't fit that's why you see them poking out of these things because they didn't fit so now i had to take a step back switch from 30 items to 20 items right. um, and, and to make it you know more so you've more. capped at 20 items regardless even if it's only two th two thirds full because you know right. you're going to recycle bigger items back into there that's, that's really right. smart that's really yeah. forward looking okay mm -hmm. that's and interesting. bhfo not only do they do that, and they have a huge inventory system, they also factor in half of the bin being space, air. Okay. Because if it's too tight, you have to move items around to get items. So I'm going to ask this because I'm super interested. So they, BFHO, does bins? Yeah. They do bins. They have 5,000 5, bins. <laughs> Just that statement alone is like... <laughs> yeah, 5,000 bins. It's insane. <laughs> so. That's awesome. That's so impressive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Man. Okay. So with that, yep. do you see challenges in the first go around? So say you do 20 dress shirts for a new, a brand new bin. Does it create challenges for you? Like if you sell an item there, do you, how does it slow you down more? Find the, no. the, the only thing that would be, um, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, slow me down because they're in file cabinet order. One, two, three, four, five, right. six, seven, nine, ten. But, um, it is going to slow me down if it's tw 20 pairs of shoes is a really tight fit. Right. So um, that shoes is a little bit of an issue because of how bulky they are. Right. But I uh, can really see only, yeah. Yeah. I can see the upside of that because like I was just thinking about today and yesterday. I listed, I had like 50 Ralph Lauren shirts. And I listed them all like back to back to back to back. So I have a bin full of Ralph Lauren shirts. I can see very easily mixing that up. You get a blue with a different color pony and a blue with a different color pony right next to each other. Right. Like, and it's inventory 0151 versus 0152. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I can, huh. I'm gonna have to think on that a little bit for my own system. This is, this is cool. a possibility of mixing it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great tip. I mean, anyone watching should really be writing that down and think about that. Think about how you get your inventory. And I mean, you guys saw I had the video out of me being an idiot using cell similar and, <laughs> sold the same pair of shoes twice, but um, you know, sometimes that happens, but this is just another way to avoid blunders like that. So that's a great tip. All right. So let me jump into mine. I can't really, I guess I'm not really um, segueing well off that one, but this is a very unique one, probably more to me than you, Chris, but I'm going to say, cause I think it relates a lot to part-time resellers. So have your inventory accessible to your schedule. And what I mean by that is everyone has a different like life schedule of how their life ebbs and flows, where they are throughout the day, what they have to do, their requirements outside of their eBay business, their reselling business. And I think it's really important to think through that and think about if, if your inventory isn't stored in your house. So this is, I guess this is the caveat. Like as you grow and scale, and we're talking about scaling with eBay businesses, when you get to the point, especially as a part-time reseller where your house just isn't big enough for the inventory. Like Chris is fortunate right now. He has a big enough space. I don't, I have a one car garage. Shannon would absolutely kill me. Like I don't have that choice. So I have two storage units. And one thing that I've done is I've put that storage unit within 10 minutes of my work so that during lunch, I can take that advantage of that where during lunch, I couldn't go home and list. Like I couldn't do other pr revenue producing activities, but what I can do is I can go get my inventory that's sold, pull it, have it in a bin and have it ready to take home with me. So I'm kind of maximizing my time in those dead spots throughout my day based on where my inventory is, where I keep it and where it's accessible to me. And I think a, a kind of a point to Chris and he may jump in and agree or disagree or add to this is one big point for you, Chris, is when you source, it comes into your garage, you list it, stays in your garage, you ship it, stays in your garage and then it goes. So he's handling it in one space only and then it's going. I'm handling mine in two spaces, which for me I have to do because I, I can't fit. Now I'm, I guess I'm approaching like 3,400 items, right, of in one space in my house. But I, I'm 
planning that out strategically so that I'm touching it as few times as possible, I'm grabbing it during dead spots of my day, and I'm leveraging my time and my busy schedule the best that I can. So I guess that's my tip really is just keep it accessible to you so it works with your schedule because everyone's is completely unique and individual. So I'll, I'll kick that back to you, Chris. I mean, I think that's in, insanely useful. Ideally, you would do everything in the same space. So right now, um, I, I focus better on listing when I'm only doing one minute at a time. Right. So I, I set up a listing station in my office, which is not in the garage. But once I get more, once my death pile is zero, I'll move it back in here. Um, and I'll just try to make sure that items I buy go up within 24, 48 hours. Uh, right. And I just don't, I, I want to be a reseller with no death pile. I don't know how to do that. But um, ideally, if I were to back my car into here in, in one side of the garage, unload the stuff, I'd be unloading it right onto the listing station. Mm -hmm. So the idea of not moving inventory around more than necessary is huge. And that may be placing your storage unit in, in between yourself and your job. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I actually, I handle my inventory. I handle my inventory from a prepping standpoint more than I should. Mm. And my bulk order made me realize that because operating out of my garage versus in my loft, I was handling inventory so much less, right? The pallets got delivered to my garage. I literally listed, stored, put it in bins and moved it to my car, which is five feet away mm -hmm. to take to my storage unit. versus I go thrifting like this weekend. I hit two thrift stores, piled back my car, I carried the bags into my upstairs loft where I sort it, prep it, then carry it, the bins back downstairs to my car and back to my storage unit. So I'm actually doing something that's not very logical and not as scalable as it should be because I haven't made my garage a, the best prep station yet that it could be. So, I mean, and that's, I think Chris has kind of the ideal setup is it's the closest point to when you pull in your driveway, your inventory is unloaded, prepped, listed, stored, and then back out if necessary, you know, when it ships. So, yeah, I, I think that's a perfect add into that. One interesting point on that is um, Toyota, um, when, when supplies come in for cars, they unload a tractor trailer, like a semi truck full of stuff, in under 10 minutes. A truck comes in, they unload it in 10 minutes, it's onto the shelves, it, into the area that they prep the items before they go into the manufacturing part. So, it is a separate area. So, like unloading, prepping, production right they have three separate areas so it, but they're in a in a line right which would be you know how we eventually want it. and every time you move it away from that line you're wasting time moving it away and back to the line so right now is a huge waste of time taking one bin to my um listing station in the house and then after i'm done listing and bringing it back out here when i could just do it here right so huh um interesting Yep. Wait, am I next? You are next. I think that we, okay. I think hopefully everyone understands that point. I think that everyone probably has their own unique examples of their setups. And I think that's why it's such an interesting tip and discussion is because everyone's setup is completely uniquely different than, to each other's situation. So, yep. So, my third system or my third tip is to use shelves and bins. Um, and my shelves and bins are in my, uh, in my description below. If you guys want to click on, the link tree, you can see all the supplies that I use. The only thing that's not in there is these bins, which I purchased at Target for five bucks. Um, they're basically 16 by 12 by 24. I'd be curious what size um, Luke um, uses. But I use a bin and shelf system, and I can go seven high on the shelves in my garage. So that's something that I recommend is a bin and shelf system, but you can do whatever system you want, but I recommend like shel like people, you'd be surprised how many items you can fit with shelves. And I actually think that, like I, I have a two car garage for eBay, but I've still only used half of one of the spaces. Right. So, um, because I'm able to, to, to vertically grow. Absolutely. Now, I, I think that's, I mean, it, it's such an, is a logical tip, but I think that a lot of people don't think about that they can do that that easily. Like someone right now is watching the video, they're looking behind you and like, man, that wall of bins is intimidating. Like, right? Like you're looking at that and going, oh, I don't have the space, I can't do that. But it's like, it's not, it's not intimidating. Like anyone could do that, right? Like it's impressive. I'm looking at it, it's impressive. But like you go to Target, you start with one shelf, 
All right, just start with one shelf. Don't overwhelm yourself. If you have 500 items, just start with one shelf in five bins, right? Just start to organize it slowly, and I think that you can get there. You know, don't let it overwhelm you. Um, I think your point about bin dimensions is really important because one thing that I did, and this is a super, super dumb, dumb thing I did. So I bought shelving units, pretty expensive ones. They're like, they're super heavyweight because I was thinking about, I do a lot of suits and blazers and sport coats, super heavy items, jeans, needs to hold a lot of weight. Agreed, I think these shelves are fantastic. What I didn't do a good job of is I didn't measure my bins and maximize the shelf space with bins. So I really screwed mm. up and not measuring and making sure that every, you know, every piece of acreage, so to speak, was spoken for. And so I have gaps, like unlike Chris, Chris is fit perfect. Mine don't fit perfect yet because I haven't, I have these, mine are 23, about 24 inches by 18 and 3 eighths by 4 and 7 eighths. 14 and 7 eighths, sorry, not 4. And so they're kind of an awkward dimension. I can fit two and a half of them on a shelf, which obviously I can't fit half a bin, right? So it's an issue. So what I have is these other smaller bins that I'm kind of like triaging in there right. after the fact. And so that was a big oversight on my part. And at some point, I'm going to have to bite the bullet. I'm going to have to measure, get bins that fit exactly and maximize that space. Because the longer I go without fixing that, the longer I'm shooting myself in the foot and not maximizing every square foot that I am paying for, basically. But vertical space by far is an amazing tip, Chris. I mean, Pete, you have to maximize your vertical space because you only can go so far horizontally uh, without a doubt. Uh, so, yeah, I, I echo that wholeheartedly. I would um, my so my bins fit on the shelf kind of they're like they're a little bit wonky because they just barely fit and they don't fit with lids so I, I live in an area with no um, like my garage is pretty seal proof but if there was animals or something um, I'd want to have lids on my on my items um, but I do put peppermint oil around the outside of my garage um, probably once a week so I, I haven't had any bugs or anything get into my garage, but um, I've I've uh, I definitely would get larger shelves of or larger bins if I could and put lids on them. Right. Um, and, and I'd like to be able to slide one bin onto the other bin and have enough vertical room for the the you know, the stain there instead of taking the bin off and pulling it off. That's too time consuming. If right. I could just slide it up, take it out, slide it back, that'd be the best. Right. Um, these Not shelves are too thing. small for that. Um, and that, so that's a good point. And I didn't really touch on that in mind. One of the reasons for my bins that I picked was I can, there are sealed bins, right? So they click, mm -hmm. they're a snap lid. So I have poly bag, right? So I seal it with a poly bag. Then it goes in a bin that clicks shut and seals. And for me, that's important because I'm in an outdoor storage unit facility. It is not climate controlled. For me, that makes a big difference in conserving it and not having a musty smell. Like a lot of the different things that come with the humidity, the south, and, and you know, just things along those. Things. Like I've been in one, I mean, since fall of 2015, I've been in a non climate controlled storage unit. And this system has worked fantastic for me. So, what I need to do is just do a better job of finding bins that fit exactly the square footage of the shelving that I've invested in. Because at this point, I have, I think I've dropped almost $1,000 in shelving. I mean, like, it's a lot. Like, I've dropped a thousand bucks in shelving over the last four months. It's worth it. It'll go with me wherever I go. If I ever grow into a warehouse, whatever, this stuff's going with me. It's not like it's a waste. But, you know, when you think about that, I should be maximizing every square inch of that, you know, especially at that type of investment. So, How much are your shelves? They're like 99 bucks at Home Depot. Um, but they're five, they're five high. They can literally, I can never, it can never weigh too much. Like that's, that was the perk of them. I mean, these are the metal, like heavy industrial metal. They have the snap in notches. Like they kind of have the load bearing engineering with them where they snap in and uh, they're really easy to put together. They're easy to take apart. Um, so like I kind of was thinking very forward, which actually kind of, I'm glad you said that it kind of leads me to my next point, which is the last, I guess the last tip, right? You've shared your three. Um, last tip around that is to create a system that you can grow into. And so, you know, just Chris asking about that, like I was trying to be as forward thinking as possible when I started purchasing these shelves. Like you think about, you know, spend a hundred bucks on a shelving unit. It's like, ugh, like, especially as a reseller, like I'm used to paying $4 for a shirt, paying a hundred dollars for a shelf. is like, oof. And, um, but I was trying to think like two, three, five years down the road of, I don't want, I want to stop buying stuff 
for infrastructure that I'm only going to use for a year and then get rid of, right? And so for me, these shelves I knew would go with me wherever I went. This inventory system with bins, like you brought up BF BFHO, right? Like I know that the bin system is a legitimate system to grow into. Now, how I'm numbering might not be the most effective, and that's why I've been talking with you a lot more about this and trying to adapt. But I'm trying to think about where I want to be three years from now, not where I want to be today. And I think that applies to a lot of new sellers, right? Like you start and you got 100 items in your closet and you're not really worried about anything, right? You're like, oh, I'm excited. I'm getting sales. I'm figuring things out. And the problem is, is all of a sudden you get to a point where it's like, crap, where did I put this, right? And you hit that critical mass where you go, where the heck is that item? And it's just, and it creeps up on you. Like it's no one's fault. It's not like, it, it just, but it happens. And you're growing and you're excited and you're working your butt off. And then all of a sudden it's like, crap, I got to cancel it or I can't find that item. And it's like, if I encourage everyone to be very forward thinking about what you want your inventory system to be like, what do you want the future state of your business to be like and operate that way. Even if it doesn't make the most sense this month, try to operate that way because eventually it's going to, right? And the more you set up to operate that way, the quicker you grow into it. Right, that's the one thing I found. Like, even though I wasn't big enough when I started doing this shelving unit thing the way I was, and I only had half the storage unit full, I'll tell you what, it filled up a lot quicker when I went to it every day and saw the empty space. I was like, dang, I gotta get moving. I gotta fill this up. Right? Like you start thinking about where you wanna be and you get there a heck of a lot quicker. So that's kind of my off my soapbox, but that would be my my tip. That's a really good tip. So on my bin, so you guys can see they're numbered A00. Uh, a zero, A zero, zero through A ninety nine on this side, right? So that's a hundred bins, and A zero zero. So I could go A zero zero, B zero zero, all the way to Z zero zero, and that's now fifty two hundred. Or, or I'm sorry, not my math's way off. Twenty six, um, twenty six hundred bins. If I use the whole alphabet, which is like insane. That's fifty two thousand items. So like that's. <clears throat> you're way beyond like growing into that that system's gonna take forever to grow through so um, and I, th I think um, we had we had briefly mentioned this but, but Luke and I both put the item number in the title and it definitely um, is one of the it takes up characters that you could be using for another keyword but it's just such True. an it's so beneficial to have it there Versus the custom skew, um, because it's 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 just something to talk about. It's it's a big topic of debate for everyone. What do you think, Luke? Yeah, no, and I think it's worth. I mean, I know we've each given out three tips. I think that's a really good one to end on. I think that we should kind of, I think we should dive deep into this one if you want, Chris, because sure. I think it's really important when you talk about scale. So, and mm -hmm. that's what we're focusing. On. I want to remind and bring everyone back that these tips are centered around scaling. Whether it's a one man, two man, five man operation, these are things that maximize your time. And a lot of times people think of scale and they're like, oh, yeah, that's me having a warehouse of employees. But you can scale by yourself, right? And what Chris is talking about and what we've started to do is a way for us to scale right now. We're not big enough to have a bunch of employees in the warehouse yet. We're trying to get there, but we're not there. And so this is a way to scale by itself. And what we do is we put the custom tag. So, like, just example. 0151 for a dress shirt is my inventory number. I put it the last four characters of my title. And what that enables me to do is when I go to my storage unit at lunch, I pull up my eBay app on my phone. I look at what's sold, and it's right there. I see 0151 next to all the items. I don't have to click the item. I don't have to drill into it. I don't have to look at the description. I don't have to wait for it to load. I just know right away I go to that bin and I grab it. Now, when you're talking about 30 seconds, a minute, depending on my service at my storage unit, right? That is huge. That's enormous. If I'm pulling 25 items, you're talking about maybe 10 to 15 minutes I saved on that trip of not having to drill in that item. To me, that 10 to 15 minutes is huge, right? You scale that over a week, that's that's a lot of time. You're talking almost two hours or a little more than that. I don't know, my math is really bad right now on a Sunday night. But I mean, when I think about the time that I waste on that, I mean, right now I'm listing 15 items actively from start to finish in an hour with my new system, right? Yep. Even if I'm wasting an hour finding items clicking into it in my storage unit, that's awful. I'm losing money. And I don't think, and I will kind of, I'll stand behind the statement. I don't, I would argue that adding those four characters to my anime listing, my title does not detract from buyers and buying items and the search engine and all those things. I don't think it has any impact at all. Um, but I'll let, I'll let Chris weigh in on that. I've talked enough on it. Well, this is my thought on that. So um, I, I went to the eBay. I've been to eBay a couple times now to 
um, some events that they've run, and this is a big topic. And what I have heard from eBay, and I agree with this, is if you have keywords that don't convert, so let's say you add the word casual to your, to your shirt. Mm -hmm. So you add casual to the listing um, because somebody might be searching casual shirt. If, they, uh, if casual is part of a different, let's say casual is a common term for fishing or something, mm -hmm. and your listing keeps showing up in something that's not related, eBay will penalize you for not converting that traffic. They're going to put somebody else's listing there that will convert. So if I look at a lot of these bigger sellers, they're not, key, they're not using all the keywords. They're not because if another word pulls up and doesn't convert, eBay is like, why are people coming to this listing and not buying it? And so no one is searching for A0526. That's why I think it doesn't hurt you. That's why I'm thinking it does take up space, but it's not a non-converting word because no one's looking for it. So if it, uh, you know, and I look at so many huge sellers that have the number in there, not this, I mean, they obviously have different, they might be successful in spite of this, but um, I know that conversion, if I ran eBay, I would promote the ones that sell more. Right. If I was in charge. Right. Well, and, and let's, let's circle back on this again. Let's go back to scale, right? So let's just say, let's go, let's jump to the other side of the fence. Let's say it does hurt you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say I sell five items less per month and I'm a big seller because of it. It penalizes me five, let's say 10 items less per month. But let's say that it takes me five extra hours a, a month. <laughs> or a week, let's just say a week or a month to find my items, mm -hmm. I can list 10, to, you know, I can list 50 items in that five hours that will convert right. to more sales than the 10 I lose and I'm still growing. So then you get into opportunity costs. So, right, it's just like when someone gets fined for something. Well, guess what, if I make $1,000 and get fined 500, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing and get making the $1,000. Just like if I'm getting penalized for the search listing, but I'm listing more and selling more than the 10 I'm losing, I'm going to mm -hmm. keep doing that. And so I think that's kind of how I view it as more of an opportunity cost. Even if there is a penalty there, I think it's smaller than the upside of finding your items faster, getting the time back in your week, especially as a one-man operation. Like, I mean, can't echo that enough. This is a great point. And also, there's a few questions in the chat asking about if it'll get confused with the size or the, the condition or the model number. And usually it doesn't because it's always a four-digit number or five-digit number, which is not the same as the size or... It's pretty mm -hmm. obscure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I I'm, think I'm, that. I would echo that. Go ahead. No, no, I just, I would echo that. I definitely agree. Um, let's see here. There, there is a, a kind of, are we jumping into Q&A now, Chris? I think we let's go straight into Q&A. I think we're good. So there's an interesting question, and I'm actually, I've been working on a blog post to address this. I, I'm really terrible at keeping up my long-form blog on my website. I'm working really hard. It's endlessentrepreneurs.com, putting a kind of a shameless plug in right now. But I'm working on a blog post, and someone asked, how much money should they invest if they're just starting new into this business? And before I answer it, I'm just going to kick it over to you, let you, you know, put you on the fire. What are your thoughts on this, Chris? You were talking to a buddy who wanted to jump in, like, how much money would you tell them to put aside? Like, so let's, and let's set the scenario. Work full time, want to make a side income, just a little extra money every month and start to build something. Let's just use that framework. What would you do? The same amount of money that you would flush down the drain as the, mo the amount yeah, of the money. The same amount of money you go out drinking Saturday, buy yeah, rounds exactly. for all night. Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that, right? Like, yeah, you can't need the money because when people, because people can sniff desperation when you, price things unusually low to get rid of them to sell faster, or they can just sense the desperation. You wanna, you wanna work with money that you don't need. That's the best way to scale, even if it's really small, because I feel like you can maximize your money. Thing that I've noticed is, in one of my previous videos, is that price doesn't matter that much. It's not as important as the quality of your item. It'll eventually sell if you have, if you have good stuff um, for a higher margin. So I would say the amount of money is, um, okay, and I learned this from T. Harv Eker. If, let's say you're starting on a credit card, right? Some people will start um, using money they don't have, and I don't necessarily recommend that, but I'm saying that money should be, you should not be worried about that money. You, you shouldn't need it for your bills. Right. So I'm going to kind of jump in and, 
So I've been really think I've been thinking this over really hard, right? So mm-hmm. I've been reselling for a couple of years and I've slowly built up and it's always been on the side as a hobby. Like I've always had a full-time income. I've never needed to pull money out of the business. And I've been trying to really reflect on if I was starting fresh, like scratch, how would I approach this? And I'm trying not to t- take too much of my blog posts I've been working on for a couple of weeks now, but I, I just want to give the kind of the content here is if I was you and you want to jump in, you're looking for a way to make extra money. The first thing I would do is like Chris said, perfect point, pick a, a dollar amount you're comfortable completely removing from your finances and never touching it again. Count it as a loss as if you went to the roulette table and lost it. Take it aside and say, this is what I'm going to use. And don't use anything more or anything less, right? So if it's 100 bucks, it's 100 bucks. It was 200, whatever. I'm going to use 200 as an arbitrary amount because I feel like a lot of people can find 200 bucks and just say, all right, I'm going to throw this at it. Um, the first thing I would do is figure out what I want to sell, right? So we sell clothing. I think clothing is a great opportunity. It's cheap. It's easy. It's plentiful. I would then figure out how I'm going to take pictures of the items I want to sell. Use your phone. Don't worry about mannequin. Use natural light. Don't worry about all the get the gadgets, right? Right away. Not yet. And then I would find every sale day you can find around you and every bins you can find around you to buy the cheapest clothing possible. And I would consume as much YouTube content as you can because it's free on brands that sell on eBay. And I would rinse, repeat until I could double, triple, quadruple that money. And I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't add money to it. I I would just source, flip, source, flip, and just keep reinvesting into that and snowball it. So that's kind of, I mean, both long-winded answers, but hopefully that helps the newer sellers in the chat here and how I would get started. One last answer on that, too, is I would sell all your personal stuff first. And get the full ah, the full money you get before you spend any money. Sell all your your belongings because even if you, even if you sell something you need, you can just rebuy it again on eBay. Familiarize yourself with um, buying and selling on eBay. <laughs> that's you know, a, that's, like a, this, that's an amazing tip, right? You actually don't even need to invest money. You mm-hmm. literally could sell enough stuff that you own to get the capital to start growing sourcing. So that's awesome. That, that's a great point, Chris. Let's Are you see. seeing any other questions, Chris, you want to grab here? I don't see too many questions today. Yeah. Um, if you guys have questions, uh, type question in the chat, then, you know, type out what it is or bit, lots of question marks or whatnot. Uh, we'll take whatever it is. Try to keep them inventory related if possible. Um, we just kind of want to keep that specific. So um, one thing that I want to put that's a little bit off topic here, but I think it's important for people to realize, is that eBay is a company, just like all companies. And it's the 80-20 rule. And they're going to spend the most of their time servicing the people that make them the most money, which is the large sellers. Right? If you, you know, look at most large sellers have some type of inventory system that allows them to find the stuff. And so even though that we're not necessarily at their level, I think it's, it's nice to at least um, research different types of sell- sellers and different types of levels. But... You know, eBay is going to set up their their whole company to to serve the people who make them the most money. That's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I, I think that's that's very very valid. I'm skimming for questions right now, Chris. I'm just to... <clears throat> so um, this is a good question. I, I was, go um, can you talk about bigger items, suits, down vests, jackets? I don't like shoving them in bins. Oh, that's great. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, go I'll, ahead. Let you take I'll let you take this one. All right. I'll jump in. All right, cool. So um, I do sell a lot of coats, a lot of jackets, um, a lot of size 13 plus shoes. They don't fit in these bins, right? So I actually just have a um, – but I do prepackage all of them. I just have a box wall. So um, I'm not going to move my camera right now, but I just basically have the boxes stacked, and I – um, put them in either medium or large flat rate boxes, or in some cases, because I'm selling some receivers or larger items, I pre box all of that um, when I'm listing because I don't like to be surprised when I ship the item. I want to know exactly how much it costs to ship um, before I do the listing. So, how I deal with bigger items is I have a box wall. That makes sense. So, I do, I do a couple things. So, first, I'll talk about sport codes. So I only do clothing. Like I pretty much, I mean, very, very rarely do I find like a board game or something that I'm gonna go. But like I pretty much just do clothing. It's easier for me to source. Um, this is a sport coat. I would consider it a bigger item. I still fit it in the 12 by 15. It's tight, but it's in here. This is a size 48, actually, I think. 
Uh, so that's a wow. big one. All right. Um, and then I fit it in a self sealed 12 by 15 poly, and I still store it in bins. Do you now, use a different size for smaller items? I do not. I use the same size for everyone. I get them Whoa. for like four and a half, five cents a piece. The scale is unbelievable. I bought 10,000 to start the year. Like, what, what dimension are yours? So these are 12 by 15 flat blocks. That, this is nine by twelve, much smaller. That's the problem, right? I, I okay. can't fit a sp I can't fit um, a blazer or a jacket in these. That's, that's, the, that is very interesting. The interesting point with the nine by twelves is they're pretty much the same price, minus a half a cent, as the twelve by fifteens. Hmm, that is that is so very when, interesting. When you start looking at pricing, you're not actually saving that much money. So what I did is I just ordered a crap ton of twelve by fifteens. I use them for everything. Now here's another example. So a suit, I can't fit a full suit in one, but I sure as heck can fit a suit in two, and it very easily can have the same inventory number. So yeah, it doesn't fit, but it just goes together, and then it goes in my my poly bag, and then off it goes. So there's big number, you know, big item number two. Now my third way that I handle it is I do have a closet of a select few items, about twenty or so, that are very big. So like I just found that big Ed Hardy puffer full zip jacket, and mm -hmm. like that, that's my closet hung right now. I have a few items like that. I keep them right here at the house. It's easier for me to keep track of them than trying to wad them up or ruin the integrity of the item. And I just keep it there. And then I ship it in like a you know priority box or something like that once it sells. So that, that would be the only exception. Do you know what size the priority Tyvek envelope is? I don't. And you know what? A viewer gave me a tip of ordering a bunch of those. Do you have one of those? Yeah, right here. Let me look at that. Um, uh, that's 12 by 15. I, I'm like pretty sure that's 12 by 15. Oh, it says on it, 11 by 6 by 15, 12 by 15, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can so fit a blazer in here. You could fit a blazer in there, correct. Yes. Wow. Especially, wow. especially if you put it in a 12 by 15 poly beforehand, it slides right in, right? Wow, guys. So there's, I mean, I get some and heat do you ever because ship, I see. Do you ever ship it in here? Uh, so I will ship them a lot of times in the padded flat rates I fit them in. Okay. Um, okay. Sometimes in the cardboard envelope ones, which I get a lot of mm -hmm. flack for, which is what it is. I've talked to my postmaster a hundred times. They are totally cool with it. Um, you know, I have not had a complaint from a single buyer. And I've, I mean, I'm approaching 500 blazers I've probably sold. And I have not had a single complaint of shipping them in there. So, I mean, to each their own. I know there's different rules and regulations. I've talked to my postmaster ahead of time. They are totally fine with it. I have not had any issues. For other people, they've had issues. And if you do, I say regional A box, regional B box, or priority box. Right? They're all free on USPS. They're the same price as one of those envelopes you just picked up because it's by weight. Um, and you know, those you have options, right? Like if one way doesn't work for you, you have options to explore other ones. So, but yeah, that's how I handle big ones. Um, I saw some other really good questions. Can Chris. you put a complete suit in there? In which one? In, the, in, a, in a padded, probably not. No, no, no. Suits, I always do. They pretty much go regional A or B for me. Okay. Pretty much all the time. Um, or I use the shoe box, the priority shoe box. Mm -hmm. I like using that box too. It's a nice dimension. It works well for me. Jason was asking how many listings we have. Ah, okay. Um, go ahead, Chris. 3,100. 3,100 3, unique or 3,100 multi quantity? 2,800. That's an important thing. That's an important thing. Twenty eight hundred list unique listings, mm -hmm. little over twenty eight hundred, and then thirty one hundred total. Okay, cool. And yeah, guys, and just for viewers, like I think it's important that when we talk about listings, like we're all in the same playing field, so that you, I don't want anyone to get a false perception of the size of a business or the amount of work it goes into build it. I want everyone to understand the sweat equity that goes into it. So for me, like he's just saying, I have nineteen hundred and I think like ten unique active listings right now, but I have well over three thousand actual items listed on eBay because of my multi-quantity LO bean listings. So I think it's important that we differentiate and are very crystal clear our definitions of how big or small our businesses are. Because um, there are a lot of excellent sellers who do multi-quantity and they might have less unique listings than us, but they've got 10 times the quantity of, right? Um, so it's just important to understand that. So that's a great question, Jason. Um, how do you set up a recurring sale in your Markdown Manager? I don't think you can. Set up a recurring sale. Can you? No, I, I haven't figured out how. If someone knows how, please share it with me. I have to restart it every two days. Um, I did switch to Good Deal Cancel just to make that easier. So if someone knows, share it in the chat, please. That like Gary, would be an tip. yeah, that would be an amazing tip. I would owe someone a beer or more or a nice item or something if you could tell me how. 
Uh, Gary has a good question. It's kind of to me, but I think we both should talk about it. It says, uh, considering you have a full-time job, where do you stop with inventory? Uh, Gary, I'm going to summarize and say that you're asking, like, when is my inventory too big to have a full-time job and manage it? Um, I think, Chris, you can still speak to this. Even though you're full-time, you're still managing your other business, right? You have someone managing it for you. So I think it's still mm -hmm. a valid question. Um, you know, like, what's too big for you to, like, get rid of that component and go all in on that and or stop growing your inventory? I think um, 100 to 200 listings is the capacity of me. I can't speak for anybody else. To go find, prep, list 100 to 200 items a week is sort of a comfortable pace with 40 hours to work with. So what is that? That's, um, so how many, but I'm going to back up. So I think his question more was how many active items, right? How the size of your inventory, when does it become too big to manage? Without having I to think shed when, the weight of your, your right, like the size. So for of me, I think that the size would probably be. It's related to the sell-through rate. So if you were selling, let's say, twenty percent of your inventory, which is, um, which is a good pace. That's like um, that's a little under one percent a day. So if you had a, um, for me, probably around fifteen hundred items you could do with 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 a. Um, I think in my opinion, if you had a full-time job, you could have a 1,500 item store on the side with a 20% or slower sell-through mm -hmm. rate. Now, I think that's a really good number actually because, um, so I have 1,900 like we talked about, but I have like a half a percent sell-through rate, like probably a little lower actually. I haven't looked in a while. I think, I mean, last time I looked, it was like 0.04%, right? Like it was less than a percent. I have a very slow sell-through. What is that on a monthly basis, 15? Um, so let's say on 1,900 items, I'll probably sell 220 to 240 in the month. Okay. 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 So for me, I'm listing 350 items a month. So my store is still growing at that rate, pretty substantially, right? Like I mean, pretty decently growing. Um, it's the reason there's two reasons, right? So I think to answer Gary's question directly, the size of your store matters with your strategy and your model. So like Chris was alluding to. I have a very long tail, slow sell through model, max price, right? I list it, I forget about it, I try to get that upper, like the upper quadrant of profit and I wait for it versus, so I can get a bigger inventory capacity. Whereas if you're gonna price middle of the market, do fast flips, right? Um, you know, two, three times your money and just keep churning and have to ship and manage all that, then it's gonna be a lot smaller. I think with my model, I think that and I'm kind of nutso, but if you're really focused on it, I think that you can manage a 4,000 unique listing business and do it part time and do that part time. But you'd have to dedicate 30 to 40 hours a week doing it. So like, I don't want to sugarcoat that. Like you have to take it on as another job, right? Like you, I spend 30 to 40 hours a week on my eBay business. Like that's just a reality. I love it. I'm passionate about it. It's easy for me to wake up at four and 5 a.m. and do that. So, if you're looking, and then I guess that's the hard part, Gary, to answer your question is what type of hours are you willing to invest? At 20 hours a week, maybe it's a thousand item store. At 30 hours, maybe it's 1500. I think that depends too, right? And it also depends on the how long your items take. If you're selling, uh, you know, 20 uh, set of golf clubs, it's going to take a lot longer than 20 t-shirts. Right. Because they're more bulky, it takes longer to pack and ship. A lot, a lot more measurements on golf clubs, the condition, you know, some items require 12 photos, some require one photo. Mm -hmm. So whatever your, your listing capacity is per, per hour of how many hours you have to do, that, that sort of will dictate how big your store can be. No, I think that's, that's great insight. There's a ton of questions here, Chris. I think we should try to get, we got about five minutes left, guys, we're wrapping up. Let's try to get through as many as we can. I've got Terry's noted. Do you see? I like Jason's, Jason's question here. Do you price your items based on eBay suggestion? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my fast answer. No, because eBay suggestions are like middle of the market. They're trending, trending prices off similar sold items which is not representative of when you're doing unique SKU, size, style, material, brand, all those factors. I don't think it's possible. I don't, no, I don't do that. Chris, do you? Um, I price at least double the low end. Mm -hmm. 
and then I uh, and I always run a sale to bring it back more. But I mean, definitely higher, way higher. Yeah, way higher than eBay suggested. So Terry had a great question, um, and let's try to answer this real concise. We only got five minutes left. I'll let you go first. But it's tell us your process when bringing okay. a haul home from start to finish. Um, I take it home. I group it in similar shape sizes uh, and type, and then I will list in batches of between 10 and 30, depending on how bulky the items are. Mm -hmm. um, I keep myself from being overwhelmed if I bought too much stuff. So then once it's packed, it's in these bags, I walk in here and I put them back into the bin. Mm -hmm. That's my process. I like it. So I'm very similar. So I buy it, I bring it home in my nice family-friendly Honda CRV. <laughs> I unload it, I take it upstairs to my loft, which is not efficient, I know. I sort it into like styles like Chris talked about. I then do a nice haul video for all of you viewers out there because everyone loves haul videos. And then I list it, package it in those poly bags we talked about, put it in the bins, label it, put it back in my car, and then it goes to my storage unit the next lunch break when I go to pick up my sold inventory, drop it off, put it on its designated shelf, and then that's done, just like that. Um, Scott's let's... asking when I'm gonna switch to a barcode system as soon as I find one. So, so I just need to do some research on some. But barcodes is better because you can scan it and then the computer will tell you if it's a match. Right. But it's, I just don't know I don't know how to use one. So as soon as I figure one out. And basically when Chris figures one out, then I'll switch to it. So if all you guys want to help Chris figure it out, then I can get to one sooner. So thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. You see any other ones here you want to grab? See, Joan said, I'm still sorting my items like items and one of my fears is switching or of switching is forgetting to put the inventory number in the listing or mistyping it and then never finding it. Um, so I'm going to give us a quick tip to this. One thing that I've done recently that's really helped is I put the inventory number in the title, I put it in the custom SKU field and I put it in the top of my description of my listing. Mm. So it's in three spots. It's really hard to mess up all three spots. So mm. no matter what I have and let's say I change one and out the other. I still have two item locations to go look at to find that item now. So that has been one one that, that's one way that's really helped me to catch and solve that. Um, let's see. Terry, let's, Terry had mentioned that some people get item not as described for using the number in the title. Uh, it's possible. I mean, it's not related. I did, I just don't I don't personally don't have any experience with that. But I'm sure eBay could bust you if you put a non-related number in your title. Um, yeah, I think the buyer would have to get really creative in their reasoning because if you ever escalated it, like, what would they say? Like, I thought it was a 0142 size. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't know where you'd go. I mean, I'm sure they could, right? Like, I yeah, they could. They could I'm selling 200 items plus a month and I have not had that issue. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Um, what I would suggest is just escalate it to eBay and see what they say, A, or B, just chalk it up as a business expense and be done with it, right? Like, I just, I can't see it happening frequently enough to waste my time on it, but I, I definitely understand the, the concern and the fear on it, for sure. Um, I'm gonna, uh, wait, let's take two more. And two more. Uh, you pick one and, I, and I'll pick one. I know which one I wanna do, but go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm gonna take RV there, yeah, I like that question. Because um, we've discussed this actually in our mastermind group a couple times. So sure. it says, for how long and where do you store original inventory photos? <laughs> I could spend an hour or two talking about this because it's, it, there isn't a really clean answer to this. Yep. How I operate is I don't store them. So as soon as my listing goes up and it's on eBay and it's live, I don't store them. I think that there is that's a big flaw if you're planning on growing immensely because you have no backups to your listing and if eBay went down tomorrow, you couldn't effectively relist your thousand or two or three or four thousand items without repicturing every single one of them. So that's just my caveat to that. But currently, to answer your question, I do not store them. I have enough faith in eBay right now not to do that yet. But it is something for the future to be thinking about. Chris, what are your thoughts there? I know we've talked about it a little bit. But. Um, and if you guys have other questions, um, you can message us on our channels and we'll get back to you or leave a comment below and we'll, we'll get back to you. We're pretty good about answering all questions. Absolutely. Um, I do not store photos at all. 
So I take photos, and then as soon as I'm done uploading my listings for the day, I delete all of them. So there's, that's, that's not a good system. So I have set up Dropbox, so it'll automatically sync, but I haven't turned it on yet. Yeah. So I'm yeah, not storing them. We're pretty identical on that. So. Um, Go ahead. You had the last question of the night. Well, last question. This is, this is a tough one to answer quickly. But um, do you have a whole inventory system on a spreadsheet? Okay, so Jason, did you ask this question? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I'm gonna caveat this with Jason on the Prop Sales channel. He does, and I'm super impressed by his inventory system. He has an amazing spreadsheet and the way he keeps track of this stuff. If you're interested in that approach, because I'm gonna say no, I don't. I think that you highly, I would highly suggest go follow his channel and see how he does it because he does it very, very, very well. Like I'm impressed. Like it's very good. I do not, I do average costing. And what that means is when I buy 100 items, I take the total cost of 100 items, I divide it by the 100, and I get my average cost per item sold. So at the end of the year with tax purposes, I have an average cost of items, and I use that as my cost of goods sold on my tax return. So I don't have a need to track the individual profitability of every item. And also because I buy, like, the extremes of me buying items, there's $2 to $10. It never gets above that for them like 99% of the time because $10 are suits and $2 are ties. I'm blessed. I live in Charlotte. I have fixed pricing. So my cost per good is always going to be in that four to five to $6 range. So I can accurately assess my business, the profitability of it using averaging. If you live in a different area, there might be a need to do that. And that's why I recommend checking Jason out if you want to know, or Chris, if he has a good answer to this, I'm not sure. I don't want to jump to conclusions for him, but uh, that's my answer. Go ahead, Chris, you can finish it up and, and drive that home. So I actually um, am trying a new system on that. So this this number a two one one seven in my, in um, right now when I'm entering it in custom SKU, I add the cost to it. So I put one two one one seven dot five. I paid five dollars for it, and then I asked Luke if you can separate a column in Excel based on a dot and separate it into two columns. So that way I can look on my sold sheet and guess what my profit is mm -hmm. but I've gotten rid of the line by line inventory system but I added the cost into the into my listing so that if I ever need to go back and look line by line I've stored the cost in the listing um, yeah. and then when I print off the items at the end I make sure the custom skews on there so I have it just in case but um, so you're you store the cost in your custom SKU yeah all right so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go full circle on that because I think that's an awesome point. And we and Chris were talking about this earlier this week. If and when I ever get to a point where I scale, and I think Chris feels the same way, that's why he's starting to experiment with this. And I scale to a point where I'm buying bulk orders at varying costs of, per item, right? Large quantities, some are at $12 per piece, some are at $2 per piece. Big, huge quantities, 1,000 here, 5,000 here. It's gonna become very important to do what Chris is saying. And I think the custom SKU actually is a really good place for it. We were talking about how to like data mine a little bit and eBay has a feature to extract all of your sold listings and the custom SKU comes off as a field. And what you can do in Excel, and I'm not gonna go too deep in this, but it's very simple. You just go to text tab delimited and you actually can separate one cell by a character, which he's talking about is the decimal point. Um, and so you could actually do a very quick profitability analysis by pivoting that and separating it. Um, by month, by week, by day. I think it's a really smart way. And I'm not ready to do that yet. I don't think it matters enough yet for me. But the minute that I make that step, I think that's the method I'm gonna use, unless a software, like we've talked about in other videos, could handle that. That would be the only way that I would skip that. But I think it's a really good intermediary step. And we could probably, I think we will, we will do a video on the future, kind of diving more into this. But it's, it's definitely worth talking about it in more, more detail. Yep, guys. So thanks again for joining us today. We're gonna, we're gonna call it good for a show. But, and please hit the like button and subscribe to Luke's channel before you leave. Um, but one other thing that I want, you, I just want to make sure you guys know: both of us have sort of leading learner channels, meaning we're learning along the way and sharing. So we don't have all the answers. Nothing we say is gospel. We're just figuring it out on the way. So um, we're really appreciative that you guys spend the time to, to talk to us, and we're learning just as much as you guys are. Could, couldn't, echo, couldn't echo that more, Chris. I mean, just this last week, I've gotten three amazing tips from viewers that have literally changed the way I do individual processes in my business. So 
I get just as much from sharing as I from you guys, you know, giving that and reciprocating. So I love all the comments. I love the suggestions. I don't know everything. I just know a little tiny bit of it. So love hearing that. Love collaborating. And uh, thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Have a great weekend. See you uh, next week on Luke's channel. On my channel. See you guys.